You're listening to the Proaxia Podcast. Hi, it's Andy Phillips here, and welcome back to the Proaxia channel. This is my top five, where I talk to musicians about the albums that influence them and shape their lives. And today we've got the brainchild behind the band Zop, multi-instrumentalist Ryan Stevenson. Hi Ryan, how you doing? Very good today, how are you? Uh, I'm really excited about this, as you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is the sort of thing I, I love. We were having a chill chat before the podcast, and uh, I was just saying that this sort of this sort of thing just really, really interests me. Where people get their inspiration from, um, you know, what's what's what music has, has filtered through their minds to bring out what they've what they're actually producing now. And uh, so this is why I, I decided to do this little uh, this little series. And I just think it's going to be fascinating. So um, so we've got uh, your top five. Uh, so shall we just dig in straight into the very first one? So we're going to go five to one. OK. Um, so what was your what was your number five? Right. Well, I, I, I've not really put like a number one. This is in no particular order. Is that all right? That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely yeah. fine. But we, we, we'll start. Yeah. We'll start with we we'll start with one, and then we will just get to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So these are all sort of basic equal footing for you. That's right. It's impossible to pick a number one, but no. uh, these are just basically five albums that mean a lot to me. Uh, albums that I've returned to over the years. Uh, a lot of them are very nostalgic i think you know i got into these when i was maybe 16 or 17 when i was discovering progressive rock but yeah i mean the first one is uh, no surprise to people that know my influences and know zop and that is uh mr frank zappa so i've got uh, i'm such a nerd i've got two cd versions and the vinyl version here so this is the uh, 69 mix that was, I think, remastered in 2008. And this is the 87 Zappa mix. So we're talking about Hot Rats. Hot Rats, of course. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention it. Um, so yeah, it's a fantastic record, originally released in 69. And I think for its time, it was a masterpiece um, because it was the first sort of jazz fusion progressive rock album and it sounds amazing for its time zappa was utilizing a lot of multi-track recording i think this is one of the first albums to utilize a, a 16 track uh tape machine so he he basically overdubbed a lot of percussion uh there's a lovely wide drum sound for this record um and I, some of the tracks are outstanding. Peaches on Regalo, of course, is a Zappa classic. Yeah. Um, Willie the Pimp, long guitar improvisation. I think it was one of the first records where he was recognised as a guitarist. I think that the records with uh, the Mothers of Invention were a bit sort of aloof and uh, satirical and political almost. But this is pretty much an instrumental album, apart from Willie the Pimp. Who uh, I think it's Captain Beefheart, right? Who guess on that? Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, for me, I always return to this album. I've been listening to it for the last two years uh, again, um, and it's inspired a lot of my writing at the moment. And it's a varied album too. So you've got, like I said, guitar improvisation. You've got structured small tracks. You've got free jazz with a song like the Gumbo Variations. And you can hear a lot of Varese in there too. Varese was a classical composer that inspired Zappa and very avant-garde percussion, percussive classical music. And yeah, there's just something about this album where I return to it over and over again. And uh, it, it, I love the complicated tracks like Little Umbrellas and It Must Be a Camel and uh, and it's melodic too. So a lot of people love it and they, they don't necessarily need to have vocals to enjoy the album. So, it, I, like I said, I always return to Hot Rats, and it always offers something for me. So, so yeah, it's, it's a masterpiece. You know, the, 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 this album. Yeah, you know, you say it was. It was. Uh, this was one of the first albums recorded on sixteen track because everybody was using like four or eight track recording at the time. Yeah, correct. But, yeah, I mean, today we can't even imagine that. I mean, how many tracks do you use uh, when you're recording an album on uh, on computer? You got what two hundred and <sighs> Well, I think the limitation in my software, Pro Tools, is 100 tracks or just above that. And this is how bad I am. I, I utilize all of those 100 tracks sometimes because, of course, 
when you're micing up a drum kit, you've got maybe, I don't know how many, 15 mics sometimes. You know, you've yeah. got all the toms, you've got the overheads, you've got the bass drum in, bass drum out, snare drum top, snare drum bottom, hi-hats, you know. So, so I, like I said, if you listen to the drum sound on this record, it is wide compared to, say, a classic Beatles uh, type of sound where the, everything's panned to one side of the, the stereo spectrum. So it sounds great and very warm uh, sound because of the extra, the mics and the overdubs. But yeah, for me personally, I, I just, you, using digital technology, you can you can go forever, can't you, and keep on overdubbing loads and loads. So... Um, this is why I think it's so impressive as well. You know, it's, yeah. it's such a, I mean, it's a fantastic album and is, is you know, Peaches and Regaler is a, is, a, is a classic and everybody knows that, but... Some of the tracks on this are, are, are just amazing. I mean, just the amazing sound quality, you know, the, the sort of warmth of it as well. Um, but it's, I just think it's worth pointing out that, you know, this is 1969. Yeah, exactly. The same the same year it was uh, in the Court of the Crimson King, yeah, which exactly. is another great sounding record. And I think they, I don't know what how many tracks they had, but I think they had to like bounce down to eight or something and overdub that. I don't know what the process was like. I think Stephen Wilson talked about that recently, where he remixed that album. Have you have you listened to that? I the remix. Right, no. Yeah, so I think he talked about the process of getting the original tapes and and what they did in 1969. But but yeah, for for the time, it's it sounds great, and I still listen to it and blown away. And it's again, it's very warm and everything's sparkly and colourful. And and the album cover, of course, I, for me, the album cover is a very important part of the process. And that is iconic, in my opinion, and uh, yeah. that's not Zappa, by the way. People think that's Frank Zappa. It was one of the I forget the name, but she was she was like a groupie basically in uh, in Laurel Canyon in, in California, and uh, I forget the name of the artist actually. The photographer is it Cal Schenkel, I think. But uh, yeah, it's an iconic cover in the sort of almost hippie like infrared uh, thing in, in the late sixties. And that, for me, the album cover is a big part of the music. So, so yeah, it, it's a it's a masterpiece. It has to be. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a fantastic album. So, Frank Zappa, what's the what's the what's your next one? Right. Okay. The next record. Um, I don't have this on vinyl, which I'm really ashamed of. Um, but this is something a bit more modern. And this is a band called Porcupine Tree. And this is uh, Fear of a Blank Planet. And this was released in. 2007 and this is at the height of say progressive metal i mean porcupine tree the very uh i suppose since the early 2000s or since in absentia which was 2002 i believe um they adopted more of a metal vocabulary with the the use of distorted guitars and uh, i suppose bringing gavin harrison in which is a heavier rock drummer and uh, they beefed up their sound a bit. But for me, people say In Absentia is the best Porcupine Tree record, but In Absentia is, is the best. And I think Wilson said that too. And that's because it's just got some classics on here. I mean, you've got a good mix of uh, the ballad, ballad type material like My Ashes. And then you've got a, a prog epic, uh, Anesthetize, which is clocking in at 17 minutes and 42 seconds. And it's got everything in it. And the good thing about this track, Anesthetizer, that is that it flows well. You know, a lot of bad progressive rock for me is where, you, you know, you've got one piece and then part A, and it just feels like it's glued together. But this song flows really well, and it's heavy, and it's it's soft in some areas. And and it's it's not really a long album, too. It's about 50 minutes, I think. Uh, which means that everything's a bit more uh, concise and it's not like a, a long journey, an endurance test. And uh, yeah, it's just a good mix of the heavier side and the softer side. And uh, I think this is the last good Porcupine Tree record, although they've, they're have releasing a new one. So yeah, I was about 16 when I first heard this. And this was a, a time when I was into a lot of progressive metal. So I'm going to get onto another band in a minute that worked with Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just love this record. Have you heard it? I have, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I love it. I, you know, that's, that's the one with uh, a solo from uh, Alex Lyson in. 
yes um, and it's also Correct. got robert fripp on the album uh, as well uh, doing some sort of um mm. uh, some sounds on the album so there's yeah. a lot of good people on that definitely and gavin harrison on drums which is you know yeah. and i think that that really does tie things together gavin, Har gavin harrison is a, a a great drummer yeah he is you know. is it it's a powerhouse, isn't it? Just, just so tight and just on the button every single time. He sort of seems, seems to play the, just the right thing at the right time, which is which is quite difficult, you know, to control drummers. Being a drummer myself, I know, I know the problem. I'm always getting shouted at for either doing too much or too little. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because he, before Porcupine Tree, he wasn't involved with any metal music at all. He was a jazz yeah. drummer, from my understanding, and he was a session drummer too. And then... But it's really hard to to comprehend that when you listen to albums like this and In Absentia and, and Dead Wing, the, the album released before this album, uh, because it's, he's just so fast and uh, he feels like a metal drummer. But then he can play a lot of the softer stuff too, like My Ashes and, and Sentimental. And uh, But yeah, it stayed with me, this album, for many years. I saw them perform this back in 2007. I think they toured the material before they released the album. So that was an interesting experience watching this this new music and not being familiar with it at all. Um, so, what it about this this album, the, the 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 sound of this album that you know really hits you? Right. Well, it's uh, well, it's clean production, I suppose. Um, and I think when you're in your teens, you, you're into metal. I, when I was sixteen, seventeen. I was into bands like Opeth and Porcupine Tree and uh, some other progressive metal. And it, it just, I think it just was a perfect time to accept this, this music. Um, and of course, I'm into other types of metal too, like black metal, which is, which is from uh, Norway in the early 90s, a lot of extreme progressive avant-garde metal. So um, around this time, you know, it was just, it was just perfect to, to absorb this album and uh, and the sound of it, I don't know. I mean, Stephen Wilson's renowned for being a great mixer and producer, so there's all sorts of soundscapes and, of course, Barbieri's ambient textures uh, really work well with Wilson's writing, I think. So, uh, and it's part of that porcupine tree sound. Is I mean, Barbieri is not really a an amazing keyboard player, is he? If you compare him to like uh, Rick Wakeman or all, the, all those classic progressive rock keyboard players, but uh, he still, I still like people like Barbieri and Brian Eno that are more based on textures and yeah. and that type of thing. So, because um, what I get out of this album when I listen to it is that it's it seems like a really immersive experience. You know, when you so I, I normally listen to to music with headphones. I sort of you know tuck myself in a corner, shut everything off, just put the headphones on and 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 listen to music because you know, it's better than just like listening to it in the kitchen, you know, but with this album, it just, it seems so immersive. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm not sure if it's been released in 5.1. I'm sure it has been released in 5.1 and he's into that immersive experience. I don't have a 5.1 surround sound and it's something that I'd like to have in the future because I do have CDs like a bonus 5.1 disc with it, which I've never used. And uh, I think he's into that immersive experience, isn't he, Wilson? He talks about, you know, albums as a musical journey and uh, almost on par with cinema, you know, like a, a David Lynch film, taking the listener on a journey. And like you said, putting the cans on, it, it does feel a lot more uh, immersive again. And uh, and uh, it's and like you said, when it's a great mixed album, it's, it's great to listen to on the headphones. So, yeah, I've done that too, I suppose, with all of these. And also the 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 because uh, it's, it's, it's there's a concept behind this as well. It's uh, about, yeah. So you know, it, it's almost like writing about um, the way I think he feels that kids today are getting sort of lost in some ways. You know, like you know, we talk about the. I think he talks of think about things like the mental health or the the well being of of uh, of kids that you know just too much screen time. You know, just uh, you know, over overdoing that thing. This is what this blank planet is. You know, he's, he, he, he looks like he's thinking that kids are going into this this chasm or this void of of, uh, of disconnection with the world. Yeah, totally. I totally forgot about the uh, the concept, and 
very sort of uh, poignant and pertinent uh, concept and it's still relevant today of course this yeah. was released in 2007 and it's uh, ever more relevant today like you said a lot of uh, kids getting into violence and uh, pornography and prescription drugs and and drugs generally and just being lost a lost generation that don't really have any purpose or meaning in their life and then resorting to all these sort of low life elements of culture, which aren't really don't show the, the greater spectrum of, of life here. You know, there's a lot more to, to life than all of these things and video gaming, of course. And the, the fact that people now don't really need to leave their home at all, do they? They can have food delivered to their door. Yeah. They can have uh, Amazon deliveries. And uh, that's very sad because they're not leaving the house and discovering the world and the beauty in the world. And, uh, I think Wilson said something like curiosity is one of the most uh, important things or underrated elements of the, the human race, because you need to, to grow and develop. You need to be curious about the world. And the way modern society is set up is that it makes people very comfortable to, to be in their home, which is, which is bad, of course. So yeah, it, it's, um, it's a fantastic concept and it really hits home today. And uh, it's, yeah, I, kudos to, to Wilson for writing about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a deep and dark sort of uh, concept. Uh, but I think the, the, the music really, really, you, you feel that, you know, the lyrics are really incredible uh, as you go through this, because there's some, there's some sort of, in uh, some of the earlier tracks in the album, there's sort of like a very childish type of lyric. Mm. That comes out. As, if a, as if a kid's written it, you know, about their parents and stuff like that. And as it goes yeah. through, it just sort of gets, it feels like the, 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 the kid's getting more and more lost as he goes through, you know, it just, I think it's an incredible album. It is probably one of my favourite albums from uh, from Porcupine Tree. I'm glad to hear And it's a good point about the lyrics, Andy, because I never really thought of that. I mean, for me, lyrics are, this might sound a bit pretentious, but the, it's more about sound and I don't really intellectualise the content so much, despite talking about the concept, you know. But you're right, reading the lyrics, you know, Xbox is a god to me, a finger on the switch. My mother is a, uh, <laughs> my father gave up, you know, so, oh, so yeah, it's, uh, he's a good lyricist, isn't he, Wilson? And uh, Yeah, and, and as you say, I think, you know, the albums like this, um, I think for a lot of people, get sort of, they, people bypass a lot of this stuff. Um, but this is why I think it's so important to listen to music on headphones, you know, it's, and, and, or on a really good system with some great speakers but you know most of the time we don't have a chance to do that so right. but just listen to it on headphones and, it, and it's such an immersive experience mm. and, and and you know steve wilson is great at that i mean he's a great mixer yeah, yeah you know he's, he's a great producer um mm -hmm. but when he actually puts this sort of thing together i i just it just sounds so amazing and then when you you start dipping into that you know the back story or the story the narrative of this as well it just you just come out of it and you go that is a brilliant album <laughs> it's such it is a brilliant album on so many levels yeah one other thing that i can think of uh i think he started to write it in tel aviv in israel um because he lived there for a while i think so he started the writing process over there and then eventually he brought the material back to the uk uh, that's just one thing I can remember about reading about the album. But um, but yeah, I totally agree. It's a five out of five for me, this. It's a masterpiece. It's something personal to me when I was sort of getting into progressive rock and seeing them live too was a big... Seeing them live a few times was eye-opening and an amazing experience. And I'll always treasure that album, you know, and I'll always uh, give Wilson... I owe Wilson a lot because the first... Uh, prog track that I ever heard was um, what's it called again uh, uh, it's off the In Absentia record I forget it now it's good. but basically that's, that's the first progressive rock album that I heard at In Absentia Porcupine Tree and it blew me away when I first heard it and uh, that was the gateway into progressive rock for me so uh, I'm right. very grateful yeah. Brilliant. yeah so yeah so um, Fear of a Blank Planet Porcupine Tree Indeed. What's your next choice? Right, the next choice. So on a similar path, I suppose, or similar scene, um, I've got Opeth. Now, this is a lot heavier. This is Ghost Reveries, uh, which was this released. Album. Do you? Oh, wow. I love this album. 
Oh, amazing. Yeah. Now it's a bit heavier for some people. Some people won't like the, the growls and the screams. And I totally understand that because when I first discovered Opeth, I, the first song I heard was window pane. I was watching TV. I think one of these sort of music video stations, I think it's Scuzz TV or one of those back in 2005, 2006. And I heard this band window pane. I was like, this is like my dad's music. So I checked them out online, uh, Opeth. And I discovered it was a Swedish band that make very extreme death metal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what's this? What? And that was my gateway into more extreme progressive rock too. And again, it, this was just, uh, I listened to this album at perfect time in my life when I was getting into a heavy music and it's a long album, 66 minutes long. Um, and a lot of heavy material, of course, goes to Perdition, Bang of the Hounds, uh, but then it's got that, still that opethy folky thing about it you know songs like atonement very melancholic and they feel very scandinavian uh it's got very scandinavian sound you know with that sort of i suppose andy latimer-esque guitar playing from from uh michael ackerfeld um and Again, there's some really good tunes on this. The Cat, the Grand Conjuration, which is a great. That was the single for the album, and yeah. uh, <laughs> of course, it's not a great single. There's no real singles off this album, but yeah, and, it, and it's ten minutes long as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, but for me, I, again, I can't put my finger on it. I can't really over intellectualize it. It's just a great record. It's, I think, it's a masterpiece of progressive metal. This. And I mean, I've never really been into progressive metal per se. I've not been into dream theatre and my best mate loves dream theatre, but I, I can't really get into that band. But for me, the, the Scandinavian approach is very dark, but it's also, like I said, got that melancholic touch to it. And and there are great dynamics on the album, you know, like you said earlier in regards to uh, Fear of a Blank Planet, a good album should have dynamics and take the listener on a journey. And this album does indeed um and yeah it's not a concept album it's i think there's some there's some occultish lyrics on this um and then i think there's some i don't know about the concepts again i don't really read into the lyrics so much but uh yeah it was produced by opeth um it was mixed by jens uh, bogren so it wasn't mixed by wilson so i think the previous albums um was it uh, was Damnation and uh, Blackwater Park and all of those before this yeah. were mixed and produced by Wilson. But this is the first one to not be mixed and produced by Wilson, but it's still amazing. And it's a very clean production. And of course, after Heritage, which, which was released in 2010 or 2011, they went down to more of an earthy, you know, 70s progressive rock sound. So this is very clean and uh well produced and i think that suits opeth and again this this time 2005 2006 2007 the height of progressive metal in my opinion and uh and then after that not a lot not many albums in that genre floated my boat but um i still well, listen to it i just gotta say the, the weird thing about this album for me yeah was uh i i'm i'm <laughs> I'm old, you know. <laughs> and I've, I've been listening Don't be hard on yourself, Andy. Don't be hard on yourself. <laughs> I've been listening to progressive rock for 50 years, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, and when sort of death metal came out, and I, I'm, I love heavy metal as well, you know, sort of old, uh, you know, new wave of British heavy metal and all that sort of thing. I love all that sort of stuff and a lot of the newer stuff as well. But when death metal, metal came out, it was, I just went, I don't want to hear this. I don't like these death scream stuff, you know, this guttural growling and, and things. I just I just bored with it, you know. I didn't give it a chance whatsoever. And then and I was complaining about it to a mate of mine. He said, I've got an album that you might be interested in then. And I said, uh, but is it a death metal album? He goes, yeah, okay. but this is what death metal actually should be. And he gave me a copy of Ghost Reveries. You know, he just gave me a copy, bought me an album, you know. Um, and I That's remember very... listening to it, and yeah. it's just, it just blew my mind. Yeah. I couldn't believe that there was a band that could do that side of that death metal side and then do this, you know, this beautiful acoustic work in the same track 
and and in context it just absolutely fantastic uh, you know the, the the clean voice michael's clean voice he just it's beautiful and warm and deep and it just sounds so bloody good yeah. and it's and it is absolutely 100 progressive rock mm. yeah i totally agree and it's good that your friend did that and i'm glad you agree that it's because some people of course didn't like this album apparently when it came out you know those hardcore metal people with the, they don't like the the progressive elements and all that but uh for me it's just it's perfect for my music taste like you said the the progressive side the folky element michael's voice is perfect and i also think watershed the next album is just as good but for this yeah. this is more like a sentimental nostalgic thing for me watershed the next record is even more like uh, progressive and extreme and there's even like some i think cellos and string elements on the next on watershed and uh of course after that like i said he went into more of a progressive rock type of sound but uh, those two records are really important watershed and ghost reveries for me yeah. and again i just return to these over and over again and they still offer something and if anybody's listening if, you, if you're wondering whether you might like opeth and you've not heard it just go on to spotify and listen to ghost ghost of edition you know it will change your mind <laughs> It will change them because that just that one track is just 10 minutes of glory, you know, it's just mm. 10 minutes of, of amazing progressive rock glory in it. And it it almost it's almost as if uh they they're using the tool of death metal in it. It doesn't sound like it's a death metal band that have gone a bit acoustic. It sounds mm. like a progressive rock band that's just using the tools of music, you know, that they're, they're they put in this death metal part in it because it absolutely needs to be there. Yeah, and I, I just remember now, actually, I think the addition of Per Weberg too is is really important in this this album because Weberg, I metal think he did precise. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that musicality um, combined with the heavier stuff, you know, the authentic or organic organ and mellotron really works perfectly on this album yeah. and uh, of course uh, people know that if you run a you know a hammond organ through a leslie and that type of sound it's heavy it sounds heavy and uh, i think that's an important ad addition to the band uh, during this time it really elevated the sound to, to another level and that's probably why it, it sounds great to my ears <laughs> great choice absolutely great choice uh yeah. so let's go on to the next one Right, the next one I've got here, um, I don't actually have a physical uh, CD or vinyl of this, partly because it's quite rare, but this is, um, it's probably an album that you're not familiar with maybe, but uh, the band is called Eskaton, and uh, the record is called Four Visions, or uh, Quatre Visions, in Fre the French band. Um, and, the reason why I like this album is because, well, it's a subgenre of progressive rock. So people are probably familiar with the band Magma. Oh, yeah, and, I know Magma. Yeah, yeah, and and they're a French progressive, but they have they have their own sound basically, and and there's a they made up Magma made up their own language called uh, Zul. Um, uh, no, sorry, it's not Zul. It's uh, Kabayan, I think. But there's a there's a term that. Um, Christian Bander, the, the leader from Magma U is called Zul, and it describes the sound, I think, of, of Magma's music. And it, people have used that term as a subgenre within progressive rock to connect all of these other bands in, in the same scene. Now, for me, Magma are one of my favorites, but um, this is how picky I am. I think they are a better live band than their studio recordings. Yeah. And that's because there's a lot of energy, and I think in the live performance and the, the studio records in the seventies, in my opinion, don't have a sort of high fidelity sound. They're a bit sort of, they're not bright enough or clean enough. Um, so for me, th this album, Four Visions, is like a better produced, cleaner version of Magma. And um, like I said, it's, it's a very avant-garde subgenre. this is all progressive rock. And you can characterize it by, I suppose, um, odd time signatures of course but more of like a fuzz bass and offbeat drumming you know like 
that type of beat throughout but not on every track of course but uh, and then of course one characteristic is female voice now this Askerton band they the, the female singer sang in French and Magma sang in their own made up language but they were I don't know what city in France uh, but this was released in 81 and around this time you've got a few bands in in the scene like Universel which are a Belgium band which are very avant-garde like classical uh, Stravinsky meets uh, King Crimson type of thing. It, there's a scene in the early 80s where they, there's a production of many avant-garde French, Belgium type of records. And this is one of them. So I'll talk about the record quickly. Um, it's, uh, it's I think it's about 50 minutes long. Um, the songs are quite long, about 10 minutes each. There's a lot of Fender Rhodes piano a lot of synthesizers. Um, like I said, the rhythm section is the most important part of the music, in my opinion. So, like I said, a really nice fuzzed up bass, which is a bit trebly, and and the drums are really powerful. And um, I can't really think of anything else to talk about. This right, you've just got to listen to it to appreciate it. It's very melodic. It's very accessible compared to a lot of Magma stuff. So that's probably why I like this Four Visions record uh, more than than Magma's studio albums. And I listened to it today, actually, when I was out. And uh, it, it's just, it's got some really heavy moments, heavy in the traditional sense of the, the term, you know, um, and like head banging moments. And, uh, you know, people are probably familiar with a song like De Futura by Magma, which is a long song. And it's, it's in that vein of, of Magma, like heavy bass lines, um, strong rhythm section and uh, unusual sort of chanting and stuff like that. So, so it's very avant-garde this album, but it's it's more accessible within that Zul subgenre of progressive rock. Yeah, this is this is uh, one of the, one of the albums that I've never heard, and uh, uh, when I had a look at, uh, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have a listen to this, see what it's like. You know, I'd never heard it before. You know, at all. I mean, I know Magma quite well, right. uh, and I like Magma. I love I love some of the old Magma stuff. You know, uh, and I, and I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, I I finally went on to YouTube to see if I could find it on YouTube, and there is the full album on YouTube. Uh, so I started listening to it, and yeah, it's it's it, and it's it is sort of it, it has that that Magma influence, but it's it's very unique as well. I mean, it doesn't sound like Magma. It's got sort of stuff that comes out of Magma, you know, sort of the uh, the overall vibe of it all. But uh, that's a very unique with uh, with the the f female vocals and the sort of driving bass and things like that. I think it's a, again, it's one of those albums. Which I, you know, now I this is why I love doing this, Ryan. You know, you discover stuff that I've never heard before. Someone says, "Oh, have you heard this?" It's, no. So, you know, to me, this is, this is, this is great because I, you know, I've got another, something else I can listen to that I've never heard before and, to, to, you know, experience for the first time. Um, oh, good. But, you know, coming out of Magma, it's just, again, Magma just, again, another band that sort of started, I mean, what, 68, 69. Um, it's amazing that a lot of stuff that we listen to goes way back, you know, I mean, this was this album was eighty one, but you know, the, just that type of music, that 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 strain of progressive rock, that French art progressive rock, going right back to sixty nine, and it just, it just blows your mind, really. But a great album, a great album. I'm, I'm going to listen to it again. Yeah, I mean, it, I think bands like Magma and Escaton and the Zool subgenre, it's a bit like Marmite. You know, some people love it or they hate it or they, yeah. they don't understand it or they can't understand it. And I totally understand that. And this was this isn't really a nostalgic choice. I got into this album only a, a few years ago and I've been listening to it a lot. And I, I think it's it's recognized as a masterpiece, again, in the subgenre of progressive rock. Um, and there are some elements which are very forward thinking, you know, the use of synthesizers is very ahead of its time, I think. I don't know what synths they were using, but it's, uh, it's a really heavy synthesizer stuff and almost a bit like techno in some sections, you know, techno music, yeah. electronic music. And uh, so it just floats my boat, basically. And I think this type of uh, this album is inspired me to to make some of the darker Zop material, my own music, 
if you listen to songs like Eternal Return on the, the Zop record and maybe like Being and Time, um, that the, this album inspired those songs. And in fact, I'm working on a record which I wrote in 2016 and 2017, which is more magma eschaton based. So, so I have a lot to be grateful for towards this album too. It's it really uh, inspired me to to write something a bit more darker and avant garde in a similar mm -hmm. vein. Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks for introducing it to me because I'm. You've got, as I say, I've got something else I can go and ever ever dig into. So, uh, good. yeah, good. It sounds like a great album. Uh, but I think if if people are coming from uh, the progressive rock side of listening to things like you know Genesis and Yes and the ELP and all those sort of things. Yeah. Um, I think these, the, you know, Magma's probably a bit more difficult to get into, uh, just as Eschaton would be a little bit more difficult to get into. But it's it's definitely worth the journey. It's definitely worth the effort to get into this stuff because it does. I mean, I didn't like Magma when I first heard them. I just it just sounded a little bit too bitty and a bit too jazzy. But you know, after listening, you know, I bought some albums and sat down again, headphones, listened to them, and, and again, it's just one of those things you just fall into this world. And isn't that isn't that what music's all about? Is to be taken somewhere, you know? Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. It's like a sci-fi journey, I suppose. This album in particular, and Magma's music, it's just uh, very spacey. Yeah, it's more head, isn't it? You know, just more head music. You know, I, I love it. I love all that sort of stuff. So, so Eschaton, uh, Four Visions, uh, released nineteen eighty one. Fantastic. So, last one. Right, the last one. one. Notable mentions. <laughs> yeah, so this this probably, I mean, it probably should be a number one. And this is not considered to be a masterpiece of progressive rock again. Um, but again, no surprise uh, to people that know my music and uh, what's inspired it. Uh, so I obviously had to pick a Canterburyian album. And look, I, I have to be honest, Egg are one of my favourites, all-time favourites. They're an underground progressive rock band. And I've got all the vinyl here. They only released three records. So this is the first one. This is the Polite Force, which is possibly the most uh, well-known record because yeah, of this is, the, this is the one you've cho chosen, Polite it's, Force. It's, it's Polite. not. It's not. No, this is not the one I've chosen, I, right. I, which kills me. But, um, you know, it's very tempting with a, a song like A Visit to Newport Hospital, yeah. which, is a, which is a masterpiece of progressive rock. Um, and it's a really important album for me. However, I'm going to talk about the last album they made, which is not as accessible, but I think it's been so important for me. And that's the this album, The Civil Surface. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, um, this was released in 74 on Virgin. Um, and it's... Look, it's not accessible in some areas. There are some filler material on it. Um, like the the wind quartet tracks, um, but for me, uh, a song like Germ Patrol, Enneagram, and Ring Out the Ground, loosely now, those three tracks are, in my opinion, masterpieces of progressive rock, and it really inspired me to write the first Zop album. And again, I can't put my finger on it and intellectualize it too much, but a song like Enneagram is just, I still listen to that and I still don't understand it. I still can't understand how he composed it uh, because it's so complicated. I don't know how long it is, to be honest. It's maybe eight minutes, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's about eight, 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 eight yeah, ten minutes, isn't it? It's eight, ten minutes, yeah. And uh, it's, it's instrumental. And the closest thing I can think of is like Stravinsky again meets, meets Zappa meets something else. Again, there's a there's a connection here with a lot of this type of music that floats my boat. Um, and the downside to this album, again, it's not a masterpiece in the sense that the mixing is not particularly great. You know, the drums are very loud on the first song, Germ Patrol. And uh, apparently they, they ran out of a budget when they were making the album so they couldn't uh, mix it properly. Right. So, so my dream is to remix this one day if I get hold of those tapes i'd love to remix it but um but it, it, i just again return to this all the time and a song like ring out the ground is the only song with vocals by mont campbell and some people don't like his vocals obviously because he's not the greatest singer in the world but it has a lot of charm because of that yeah. you know some of my greatest uh some of the vocalists that i like the most 
don't have the best voice, like Robert Wyatt, for example, or, you know, oh, they're in. I love Wyatt's vocals. Yeah, exactly. It's just imperfect, but it's uh, quintessentially English. And, yes, uh, and, and so fragile. fragile. Yes. Vocals. So this it so, seems so fragile, and I love it. I love that. But, you know, I mean, mm. you can't really go wrong, Dave Stewart, you know. <laughs> you can't go wrong. You can't. I mean, you listen to that keyboard sound and his solo sound, and it just puts a smile on your face, doesn't yeah. it? And, yeah. you know, th this band, of course, I can at the end, I can talk about a few more records if we have time. But uh, they were inspired by Soft Machine in the early days, obviously, with the use of the fuzz organ, which I've incorporated in my own music. And, um, yeah, I think Dave Stewart's solo playing is fantastic. But for me, my hero is Mont Campbell, the, the bass player and the, the singer, because he wrote most of this material. And like I said, it blows my mind that somebody, I think he was maybe like 23 or 22 when he wrote a lot of this album. And it just blows my mind that he could write something like that. And uh, and that that's the magic of music, I suppose, where you just keep on returning to it and you, you're trying to understand how they made it, but uh, you've not really tapped into the magic in its entirety. It's just, I don't know, it, it, it still offers something for me. And the album cover... It, 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 yeah. One of the things you just said there, you know, he's, he's, he's you know, in his 20s to early 20s when he put this together. Yeah. And, and all these bands, you know, we, we forget... You know, yeah. because they're like, you know, 40, I mean, this is what, 46 years old or something like that, um, this album. Mm. Uh, was it 74 or something like that? I think it's um, 74, yeah. Yeah, and you've got Steve Hillage on it and things like that. You know, the, 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 the thing with all of these albums is that these are these really kids. I mean, 20, 21, 22, 23 years old, mm -hmm. you know, producing these sort of albums in, in 74, it's like a growth in consciousness or something or something in the water or I don't know what it was, but it's obviously a magical period, wasn't it? I mean, from yeah. Sergeant Pepper to, you know, the mid to late seventies. And, um, and again, it, it, just young kids being inspired by classical music and wanting to do something experimental and pushing the boundaries. Yeah. And this, this again, isn't an easy listen. And as I say, the, the wind quartets, the filler material is like, classical interludes which aren't great but uh but the rockier tracks are just um they still amaze me and of course you've got the northernettes you've got amanda parsons um and barbara gaskin yeah. and then uh is it anne rosenthal i don't know much about her to be honest but yeah i, I love that element of the female voice again something i've used in in zop's music um and th they sang on a i think it's a track called uh nurch and a prelude i think they sang on that if i'm uh, not mistaken and uh, these are shorter songs again but very avant-garde in the style of say henry cow yeah or, uh, or some of those sort of bands in, in the scene um and it's the last album they made uh which is very sad but i think some of the the best bands that i like only make two or three records and <laughs> And uh, they went out with a good one, and uh, they basically reformed to make this album. I think they split up uh, after the Plight Force, and then they did separate jobs. And um, I think maybe Dave Stewart went into Hatfield in the North. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, there's such, such a crossover, wasn't there? Uh, in yeah, that day. So just people just like jumping from band to band to band to do different things, like Hatfield and North and all those sort of things. Uh, yeah, but you know, a little bit of Steve Illich on again can't go wrong. <laughs> Love a bit of Illich. Definitely, yeah. I mean, he's not really, uh, you know, clear on the album, is he? I think he just plays a bit of heavy guitar on Ring yeah. Out the Ground. Yeah. And, uh, that, yeah, that, that's it, I suppose. But, yeah, Steve Hillage, I love his music, uh, Fish Rising. And yeah. uh, and a shout out to Khan, the, the record Khan, Space Shanty, is it? I love you, that album as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I love Dave... all, those sort of, all those sort of things. I'm a really, really sort of big Canterbury fan. And I think that's why I loved your album so much, because it just... It's like a contemporary sort of. It's like a almost like a homage, but it's like it. It, it just feels so Canterbury, but it's it feels so modern as well, which is why why I love the Zop album. Thank you. Yeah, it's it sort of you can feel where the influences are coming from, but it's it, there's all brand new. It feels just all brand new stuff to me. Good, yeah, it's a good compliment because it's that's the thing with my own music. I'm not trying to be retro and try to ape these bands, but. You can tell with my own music that it's uh, inspired by this type of material. 
uh, but I don't want to, you know, be a museum. I'd rather do something that's trying to push the boundary again. That's trying what to I love about it. It just yeah, it, yeah. It reminds me so much of it, it gives you the vibe of the Canterbury scene, but it's yeah. brand new stuff, you know, really, really well recorded. Love the drums on it, love the keyboards on it. You know, yeah. I just I think it's that's a great album, which is uh, why I got in touch with you in the first place when we did our interview a little while ago. Um, yeah. Because I just wanted to see, see where that comes from. This is why I asked you to come on here because I want to know where where your influences come from. And, and I think you can see where the the, the the music you produce. There's you can see where these these things come from. These like germs of ideas and uh, and vibes and soundscapes that you put onto your own album. Um, you know, especially yeah. with like things like the organ sound. You know, it's, I just love all that. I just love mm. all that. So yeah, perfect. So. Okay, so we, we, we've gone through five. Uh, I know that was quite painful to sort of choose just just five. So what about honourable mentions? Right, so I've got a few. So, um... let's, let's have a dig into a couple of couple of honourable mentions and see what, uh, who you've got. So again, on a similar theme of Egg, uh, shout out to some of these classic Canterbury records. So third, Soft Machine. Yep. Uh, this is a difficult record for some people. Um, long songs, uh, but very influential again for bands like egg hatfield and the north and uh yeah fantastic songs uh slightly all the time uh, moon in june trying to find the song titles actually and uh it, for me i i still love this a facelift the first track is uh, recorded live i think in birmingham so it's a bit difficult on the ears but there's something I don't know, uh, appealing about this album. And the first time I heard it, I didn't understand it, didn't like the sound of it. Some people don't. I've read some of the reviews. But I love this album. It's fantastic. Again, Sock Machine 2, I love this uh, record. Uh, a bit shorter, about 35 minutes, I think, uh, with Wyatt singing more. But there's some really heavy fuzz bass on this and by Hugh Hopper and uh, great compositions. Um, National Health, Accuse and Cures, uh, something uh, a bit more structured. Uh, Dave Stewart, of course, from Egg, um, and uh, the rest of the band, Phil Miller, um, Pit Pile, and who else? I can't remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, John Greaves on bass. So yeah, great record. Hatfield in the North, obviously, the first two albums, uh, Masterpieces. Yeah. The first two records from National Health too, um, and then we've got some obscure ones here. I mean, this is—I love this album, Anecdoten from Within. Uh, I got into them when I was in my teens, and I, I just love the sound of this record, From Within. Uh, a song like uh, Hole, which is fantastic, and I love Gravity too. The, the album after that, which is more, um, I suppose. Not commercial, but accessible. Uh, so, from within is fantastic record. Um, yeah, holds a great track. Yeah, it's heavy, isn't it? In the middle, yeah. very, very heavy. It's, it's it, great. Sort of, it reminds you a bit of like of, of um, sort of sort of crimson in some ways, you know. I think it's good the Mellotron. I think <laughs> I think it's the Mellotron that sort of just gives you that sort of reminiscence of uh, of crimson. But that, when was that brought out? That this is two thousand. This is 1999. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, 1999. Right. Okay. Yeah. This this is a repress of it, and uh, yeah, it's just just got a really nice warm sound to it. And yeah. uh, I I'm just I probably listened to fr the track from within thousands of times, you know, throughout the years. Uh, and I discovered the this band again through my dad's record collection, just listening to CDs and. And this is probably my gateway into Scandinavian music, you know, getting into bands like Anecdote and opened me up to listening to, I suppose, bands like Opeth eventually and, yeah. and other bands in that Stockholm scene. I've always, I've gone to, been to Stockholm many times. I've met Nicholas Barker from Anecdote and he works in a record store in Stockholm. So I've had a chat with him and yeah, I got him to sign the records like a fanboy and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, no shame, so, in that. <laughs> no shame in it. No, I mean, again, it's just great to speak to these people and you know, ask them how they made the records and their influences, like you're doing with me, I suppose. Um, it's all sharing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I love anecdotes and they, they just classic progressive rock. And uh, I suppose this is a masterpiece, but I, I love this record and uh, still listen to it today. Uh, th this is a more obscure one. Uh, this is a band called 
Jagajazist or Jagajazist in Norwegian. They're a Norwegian band from Oslo. And this was released in 2010. And it's called One Armed Bandit. And again, it sounds similar to Zappa, uh, uh, but it's it's very eclectic, the influences on this. You can hear Steve Reich, which is more of a modern classical minimalist composer, a lot of staccato and uh, xylophones and vibraphones. Uh, but you can hear also Gentle Giant in this music. Uh, there's, a, there's a song called uh, Prognis Kungan, which means King of the Prog Elves in Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, and I mean, people will listen to it and cite Zappa and, like I said, Steve Reich. Uh, but I, this was a really important album for me when it came out 2010. I, this inspired me to make a lot of Zop music again. Very melodic, very jazzy complicated um but catchy so uh, there's one final album that i'd like to mention and this is so got the plastic covering on actually i should take it off uh, right this is an album called uh, carboniferous by a band called zoo oh. and they're italian now if you like heavy music uh, uh, instrumental jazz uh, avant-garde music this is a masterpiece uh it's it's very progressive i think mike Patton from uh, faith no more and uh, mr bungle do you know mike Patton? Um, uh, uh, yeah uh, yeah well faith no more yeah yeah um he was involved with this album i don't i think he just like produced a song um but it's uh, ipecac i think which is mike Patton's label although it's been repressed on a different record label but originally it was Ipecac, I think, and uh, this was released, I think, in 2009, although there's no... 2008 it was recorded. Uh, so it's heavy, very just a trio, bass, uh, guitar, drums, and uh, I think baritone saxophone. It's really heavy, it's catchy, it's um, headbanger, but I've always loved this record, and I saw them live in Nottingham. There's only about... 20 people in the audience but it was worth it and i suppose that's it that's my uh list of very uh, of personal subjective favorites that have inspired me to make music and stuff i always return to fantastic so we had egg flight for uh, egg uh, eschaton for visions it was egg civil surface yeah oh civil service that's right sorry yeah. That's right. um, I've got the other one on my brain. Um, so with Eschaton, that's the one I hadn't heard of, Four Visions. I thought, you know, we, again, I've got something else I can go and have a listen to now. Opeth, uh, Ghost Reveries, which is a big favourite of mine as well. Um, yeah. Porcupine Tree, Fear of the Blank Planet, great album. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Frank Zappa, Hot Rats. Yes, uh, which is a fucking brilliant album. <laughs> <You> just, <laughs> I mean, again, you just go, just quickly going back on that. I mean, when you think it was coming out in 1969, it just blows your blows your socks off, doesn't it? It does. The yeah, sound quality and the warmth and the depth of that album alone is just just amazing. So, yeah, uh, a quick quick note on that. Like I said, I mean, I got the to nerd out quickly. I've got the 87 mix, and some people like that. But it's a different mix entirely. And I think some of these songs are extended, but uh, for me, the original mix is nice and warm. The drums are loud, and it it just sounds great, like you said. Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. I will stick uh, a link into uh, the Zop album uh, below in the comments, so you can have a if you want to have a listen to uh, to Ryan's album, uh, Zop album, then you can do. But uh, for now, mate, fantastic. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us on the Progaxia podcast. Don't forget to like this video and also to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel. It really does help us. We'll see you next time.